Hey there. This Art Gips Vizled is going to look at gargoyles and the gothic aesthetic. Gargoyles. Say the name and some will think of spooky creatures, while others think of adorably cute little monsters, and still others will think of Disney movies and series. In addition, there are numerous characters out of our contemporary popular media culture who can be traced directly to the gargoyle, even though they are not explicitly named as such. The backstory of these gargoyles and their contemporary reinterpretations is fascinating and worth a closer look. First of all, the term gargoyle technically refers to a carved or formed figure designed to convey water away from the roof and outer walls of a building. This very practical function prevents rainwater from running down the walls and eroding away the mortar between the stone blocks or bricks, as well as weakening the foundation. The term originates from the French word gargoyle, thought to mean throat. La gargoyle is the name of a French dragon who terrorized the people of Rouen until subdued by Father Romain, according to legend. To gargle is a related derivative, as well as the gurgling of water. A similar figure that does not convey water is technically called a grotesque, but in everyday speech we commonly refer to all such figures as gargoyles. While they are a special element of Gothic architecture during the Middle Ages from the late 12th to the 16th centuries, they were not invented then. Water spouts can be found in the form of lion's head on ancient Egyptian architecture and on Greek temples that date back to at least 450 BC. But even these earlier water spouts are now referred to as gargoyles. So why and how did the term gargoyle become so prominent? Good question, and the answer can be found in how dramatically the Gothic style revolutionized the European conceptions of not only architecture and cathedrals and buildings, but also of the multimedia experience. To appreciate this revolution, we have to look briefly back to the Romanesque architecture, which preceded it during roughly the 6th to the 11th centuries. These were the Dark Ages of Europe, where few written records existed, except for in Ireland, of course, where Celtic and insular art flourished. On continental Europe, though, villagers feared for their safety from rummaging bands of pillaging mercenaries and bandits who would frequently storm through and take what they could. Romanesque architecture had spread across Europe during the Roman Empire, and Roman building methods survived after the decline of this empire, even as regional styles developed. While many castles offered protection to their feudal vassals, there were far more churches that had been built in the Roman tradition which served as fortresses to protect people from attacks. These structures were characterized by round Roman arches, small windows that could be more easily defended, and thick, massive walls with little, if any, ornamentation on the outside. Why? if it was just going to be smashed at some point. With such massive, heavy walls, they were moderate in height, and inside they were very dark and gloomy. Across Europe in the late 11th and 12th centuries, there was an unprecedented growth in the number of churches built. The power and influence of the Catholic Church increased as well, even as the Crusades from 1095 to 1270 caused a large movement of people all over the continent and the Middle East as well, along with all of their ideas, trade skills, and stylistic aesthetics. Cities began to form, providing more security from foreign attacks. Upon their safe return home, the wealthy nobility of Europe thanked their Catholic God by building a new church or renovating an old one. One such church was the Basilica of Saint-Denis in a northern suburb of Paris, which was rebuilt, completed around 1150, using innovative structural and decorative features, then referred to as the French style, and it soon went viral throughout the continent, from Spain to even Austria, but it never made it south of the Alps into Italy because they thought the style was utterly vulgar. 
in the later Renaissance, Giorgio Vasari, a famous influencer in his day, derided the barbarous German style in 1550, attributing it contemptuously, yet mistakenly, to the Goths, who were considered to be rude and coarse. The name stuck. Now, the Basilica of St. Denis is considered to be the first truly Gothic building and an architectural landmark. Gothic architecture is characterized by several distinct elements. The pointed arch, the ribbed vault, flying buttresses, towers and spires, rose windows, lofty interiors filled with stained glass light, elaborate portals, and gargoyles. Pointed arches did not originate in Gothic architecture and had been employed for centuries in the Near East in Islamic architecture. Pointed arches not only present a distinct visual stylistic divergence from the previous Roman arches, they are capable of diverting weight even more efficiency. Ribbed vaults enabled the great height and large windows of the Gothic style. Unlike the semicircular barrel vault of Roman and Romanesque buildings, where weight presses directly downward and requires thick walls and small windows, the Gothic ribbed vault was made of diagonal crossing arched ribs. These ribs directed the thrust outwards to the corners of the vault and downwards via slender colonnettes and bundled columns to the pillars and columns below. The space between the ribs was filled with thin panels of small pieces of stone which were much lighter than earlier groin vaults. The outward thrust against the walls was countered by the weight of the buttresses and later flying buttresses. As a result, the massive thick walls of Romanesque buildings were no longer needed. Since the vaults were supported by the columns and piers, the walls could be thinner and higher and filled with windows. Flying buttresses are half arches outside the building which divert the thrust of weight from the roof or inner vaults over to heavy stone columns. Buttresses were placed in rows on either side of the building and were often topped by heavy stone pinnacles, both to give extra weight and for additional decoration. Over time, the buttresses and pinnacles became more elaborate, supporting statues and other decoration, as at Bouvet Cathedral and Rheims Cathedral. The arches had an additional practical purpose. They contained lead channels, which carried rainwater off of the roof expelled out of the mouths of stone gargoyles, which we will look to at more closely soon. Towers and spires presented dramatic spectacles of height and ensured that the churches were the tallest and most visible buildings in the entire area, which was important to the Catholic Church. Rose windows were symbolic of the Virgin Mary, signifying a sacred space to shut away external influences Many evoke the mandalas of Buddhist tradition. Stained glass windows were extremely complex and expensive to make. Many windows throughout the church also illustrated stories from the Bible to people who could neither read nor own written Bibles. Lofty interiors filled with stained glass light offered an overwhelming experience to churchgoers. Combined with special incense aromas, the resulting multimedia experience could transport people into inspired states of awe. Remember, back then, the feudal system ensured that only a few people were extremely wealthy. Most people lived in small, cramped houses that reeked of body odor, animals, old trash, and poop on the street. Let us try to imagine what this kind of awe felt like in contrast to the hardship of daily life in the medieval ages, while we take a short break. Another important element of Gothic architecture were elaborate portals, which provided a visual interface between the outer, everyday, brutal, brutish world and an inner, holy, sacred, rarefied, wondrous world. These porters were decorated with numerous sculpted figures and saints from the Bible. While sculpture was an important element of Gothic architecture, significant to note is the edict 
of the Second Council of Nicaea in 787, which declared, quote, the composition of religious images is not to be left to the inspiration of artists. It is derived from the principles put in place by the Catholic Church and religious tradition. Only the art belongs to the artists. The composition belongs to the fathers. End of quote. Here, art was still explicitly in servitude to propagandize Catholic doctrine. Gargoyles decorated the exteriors of Catholic churches as fabulous and frightening monsters, while they served a practical function, removing rainwater from the walls and foundations. They also provided visual messages for the illiterate worshippers. But there has never been one clear interpretation as to what these figures mean. Some view the gargoyles as symbols of the evil and danger that threatened those who did not follow the teachings of the church. Others believe the gargoyles to be protectors in the tradition of apotropaic magic, that is, devices that ward off evil influences, such as the gorgon's head. Along with grotesques, some depicted chimeras. Yes, chimera, even though it looks like chimney. That's English. These are hybrid creatures of different real or fantastic beasts that embodied what the church viewed as the bestiality of heathen life. Or some could be a kind of griffin, a legendary creature part eagle, part lion, thought to be especially powerful and majestic a Christian symbol of divine power and a guardian of the divine. Whereas the look of Gothic sculpture and stained glass imagery were heavily determined by Catholic doctrine, gargoyles gave artistic freedom to medieval sculptors to creatively explore the darker, monstrous sides of our human identity and fashion forms of visual expression that convey how bestial and terrifying our own inner monsters can be. I would like to imagine that these medieval sculptors intuitively knew that by externalizing these inner beasts, making them publicly visible for all to see, these dark, powerful forces no longer have complete power over us. Rather, if we allow them, they can become ferocious warriors who defend us from those who seek to hurt us. Through the 12th to the 15th centuries, Gothic architecture became more and more elaborate. Catholic church and masons who built their churches became extremely powerful as they exerted enormous influence upon the economic status of towns and entire regions over generations, for such buildings took decades, if not hundreds of years, to complete. Outstanding churches became famous pilgrimage sites, like Maria Zell, north of Graz, whose original church, was built around 1350 in the Gothic style. Such pilgrimage sites brought in a continuous income for generations. Each new Gothic cathedral, castle, or palace sought to surpass and outdo previous constructions. The Gothic style became more and more flamboyant, which is in itself a name for a phase of Gothic architecture from 1350 to 1550. However, during the 1500s, Renaissance architecture from Italy began to spread, offering a more sober, classic, reduced, and elegant style. Over the next centuries, many Gothic churches were renovated in newer styles, such as Baroque in the early 17th century through the mid-18th century. In the early 19th century, Romanticism and literary works such as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, published in 1818, John Polidori's The Vampire in 1819, or The Hunchback of Notre Dame, written in 1831 by Victor Hugo, helped usher in a renewed interest in the Gothic aesthetic. The Herz Jesu Kirche, the largest church in Graz, is one of thousands built in a neo-Gothic style. By the way, Notice the three-point perspective of this photo. If you look even more closely, though, you will see that gargoyles are not as pronounced as they were in the original Gothic style. One reason might be the improved and cheaper drainage systems. Hand-carved stone gargoyles are very time-consuming and therefore very expensive to make. Perhaps also in the 12th century, when artistic freedom was so restricted Sculptors carved gargoyles and grotesques 
partly on their own time, to let their own creative energy out in rebellion against the authoritarian church fathers. In 1930, the Chrysler Building, with its iconic gargoyles, was finished as the world's tallest building, for 11 months anyway. In the same year, Grant Wood painted American Gothic, which took reinterpretations of the Gothic aesthetic to new levels of Midwestern charm. In the late 1960s, the term Gothic rock was coined to describe a style of music played by such bands as The Doors and Velvet Underground, who rebelled against the old white male government, which continued to send young women and men to die in Vietnam. In subsequent decades, the post-punk bands Susie and the Banshees, The Cure, Bauhaus, and Joy Division, among others, inspired the goth subculture that developed in the United Kingdom during the early 1980s, which spread throughout Europe, North America, and the world in diverse ways. This gothic subculture influenced different artists, not only musicians, but also painters and photographers, whose works show particular mystic, morbid, and romantic motifs very similar to the Gothic novels in the 1800s. It still thrives in the performances of Marilyn Manson, the films of Tim Burton, and the romanticization of vampires. Bram Stoker wrote his Gothic horror novel Dracula in 1897, ten years after the Herz Jesu Kirche was completed. The Gothic aesthetic continues to resurface in our society, changing in ways that always reflect current events and whoever is trying to currently exploit whomever else. Why? Perhaps because it taps into something deeply rooted in our Western psyche, a dark, mysterious, fantastically wild force that does not conform to the laws of science, one that will either overwhelm you or help you overwhelm even darker powers who seek to enslave you. Chimera or Griffin, it depends on upon what you allow yourself to wish for, because both urines, along with the entire gothic aesthetic, are embodied in the gargoyle. Until next time, take care of yourselves and your gnathic mojo.